All right, here we go. Buckle your seat belts. We got a lot of stuff to cover and I'm going to move fast. I haven't made it through all the questions yet. I've had to table some to the following week, but this week we got the final set of questions and because this is the last installment, I wanna get through them. Here we go. Question number one. And this is perfect because we have not received the offering yet. Here's the question. I understand the biblical concept of a 10% tithe, but I'm wondering if your tithe can be something else like your time or volunteering at church. Great, great question. And yet this is a really, really easy one to answer. And I'm so glad I get to speak about it today because it gives me a chance to say thank you to so many of you who sow into this ministry and give online for 18 years. This church has been able to accomplish so much for God because of the generous hearts and the lives of New Hope. Now to the question at hand though, there is tension in the question itself and I hate to break it to you, but I truly believe what I'm about to say. When people try and substitute tithing with things like their time or their service, I really believe that they're typically trying to find a loophole in this whole concept of honoring God financially. You know, it was Martin Luther who said, there are typically three conversions in life. There's the conversion of the head, there's the conversion of the heart, and there's the conversion of the pocketbook or the wallet. And I have found that to be true. Nowhere in the scriptures, nowhere does a tithe mean anything other than honoring God with your resources. Not substituting it for other things, but honoring God. It was an agricultural uh, culture in the Old Testament, so they would honor God with their crops or their livestock, which was just like money. And then in the New Testament, of course, it's money. Look at Numbers 18, 26. Speak to the Levites and say to them, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. Look at Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new why? Notice the emphasis upon the first fruits. I get this question a lot. Are you supposed to tithe off of your net or your gross? I've often said, do you want a net blessing or a gross blessing? It's clear in scripture that we are to tithe off the first fruits. As it comes in, I give God first because God is first and a high priority in my life. One more from the Old Testament, Genesis 14, 19, and 20. And God blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of the heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. To which some of you might say, Well, you're in the Old Testament. I've heard that the Old Testament is the only place you read about tithing. No, no. No, look at Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This is Jesus speaking. He's speaking to the Pharisees. They got on his last nerves. He says, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You see, in the teachings of, of Jesus and in the Pauline epistles, this whole concept of tithing. So nowhere in the Bible does it justify substituting the tithe, which is apodicato, which literally means 10%. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we can substitute that for something else. Corey Tim Boom said this, I have held many things in my hand and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hand, that I still possess. It's a great, great quote. 
And because we haven't received the offering today, I want to take a moment just to encourage you. If you haven't started giving online, let me encourage you. Go to newhopechurch.org forward slash give and check it out. Or you can text NH Movement to 77977 and follow the prompts. But I want to show you a video that shows you just how easy it is, how secure, safe, and reliable online giving is, but more importantly, gives you a glimpse of what your giving does in and through New Hope Church. Right after this video, and it's a short one, right after this video, I will get us into question number two. Check it out. At New Hope Church, your tithes and offerings are used to advance God's kingdom as we reach, teach, and release throughout the Carolinas and beyond. From bringing hope to our local communities around each of our campuses, to staffing those campuses, to serving in missions around the world, we strive to steward over your gifts in the best way possible. We also want to take the hassle out of the giving process. That's why we have many different ways that you can give. Online giving is the most reliable, convenient, secure, and effective way to give. Simply text NH Movement to 77977 and follow the link to a portal where you can enter your gift amount and choose between a one-time gift or recurring gift. Enter your payment information and you're done. It's that easy. If you prefer to use our website, simply go to newhopechurch.org forward slash give and follow the instructions. You can also give by sending a check or cash to New Hope Church at 7619 Fayetteville Road, Durham, North Carolina, 27713. As always, if you have any issues or questions, please give us a call at 919-206-HOPE-4673. We are truly grateful for your financial contributions and we are excited to partner with you in spreading the hope of Jesus throughout the Carolinas and beyond. So again, thank you so much for your generosity. God is using you. Question number two, and I want to preface it with this, by the way. This is one of the most popular questions that pastors receive. Here it is. From your studies of the Bible, do you feel that we may see our beloved pets in heaven? I lost my first dog recently. Here's my answer. Dogs, maybe. Cats, never. <laughs> No, I'm I'm just kidding. For you cat lovers, I'm just kidding. I know that uh, you love your cat as much as we dog lovers love our dog. Here's, Here's my true answer. I don't know. And I'm okay with letting you know that. I just... Don't know. Now we're going to unpack a few scriptures, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to know uh, for sure because the scripture is not crystal clear on it. The Bible doesn't give an outright answer to the question, but as we dig into the scripture, we can piece together some scriptures and maybe make an educated guess, but it is a guess. Number one, heaven is better than we know. Why don't you just type amen on that? As we fight this good fight, it's helpful just to remember that heaven is good and the story ends good. And we've read the book and when you get to the end of it, we win, praise God, it's good. But this is a tricky topic. Do you think the streets of gold and of beholding Jesus' face and being with the saints of old is a glorious, wonderful concept, but it's one that we're not sure about pets. Revelation 21.4 says this, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Heaven is good. It's going to be amazing. But no matter the picture you see, it is a limited picture from what we find in Scripture. Number two, second thing you might want to write down or or take a note on, heaven is for those who are saved. It's for those who are saved. We know John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10, 9, whoever believes in Jesus 
who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord will be saved. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life in heaven. Now, God created dogs and all animals for a good purpose, even the kitty cats. Some of the cat lovers will thank me for saying that. The creation of all animals happened, if you go back to Genesis, happened on day five and six of the creation story. Sea animals and birds were created on day five. God said they were good. Land animals were created on day six, the same day humans were created. Again, God said it was good. Now, God created man in his image, different than pets, different than animals. Remember, we've been talking about this even as we've been looking at race issues lately. We are all image bearers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Someone praise the Lord. Type that in. Thank God for that. The earth, the sky, the star, the moon, and the animals were created by the words of God. He spoke them into existence. Bam, and it just happened. But when God says that he's going to make man in his image, Genesis 1:26, he takes an approach to creation that he doesn't take with any other things on the earth. He scoops down into the dust and the dirt. And he creates humanity. And he breathes into us whew, the breath of life. The word is pneuma. And we have that breath inside of us. And we have a soul. And we bear the image of God. So as you take all of that, and there's not much more in Scripture, the question again, will I see my dog in heaven? We're not sure. Animals are listed among the residents of the new heaven. If you go back to Isaiah eleven eleven, where it says this, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. It's a beautiful heavenly picture of peace. The description of peaceful relations between species of animals continues for three more verses in Isaiah 65, starting in verse 25. And lastly, I had this thought as I was pondering this fascinating question. Have you ever thought about this? The Bible says Jesus will return on a white horse. Have never thought about that in light of this question about pets being in heaven until I got to work in my study this week working on this message. I'm talking about Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 16. Listen to this and just catch a glimpse of heaven as we live in these times. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called what, church? Type this in, faithful and true. With justice, he judges and wages war. Verse 12, his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, check it out, dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God, the Logos. Jesus, in John 1, the Bible says, the word dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Verse 18, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Almighty God. On his robe and on his thigh. Check this out. I get a question in a moment about tattoos. This is fascinating. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm not saying he had a tattoo on his thigh. I find that fascinating though. 
So once you dig in the scripture and you look at all of the tension and the possibilities, I don't know. I really don't. I think you can take some of these passages about the lion and the lamb and the wolf and the white horse and you could possibly build the case that maybe God's creatures, animals are in heaven. But the truth is we're not going to know till we get there. And it's surely okay to hope and pray that they will be. Here we go. Question number three. It's on tattoos, like I said. Here's the question. What does the Bible say about tattoos? What does the Bible say about tattoos? And oh my Lord, have they gone mainstream. Everybody seems to be getting tattoos these days. Leviticus 19.28 says this. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. And so, for all of you who have tattoos, you are sinners in the hands of an angry God and you should try to get them removed immediately. No, I'm just kidding. It's really hard to build the case on this one verse, particularly if you go back and start to study the context. In the Old Testament, what was very, very popular was the worship of Baal. And this has been dated to at least before the Exodus, making it contemporary with the time in which Moses was given the law. The Canaanite religion involved many rituals, including self-mutilation, one ancient verse described ritual masochism. And God was saying in this Leviticus text that he did not want his people to hurt themselves gratuitously. Self-mutilation is dangerous. I think we would all agree. And it can lead to significant health problems, particularly way back when. His people did not enjoy the advantages of 21st century society, hospitals, doctors, antibiotics, and the like. And if you read through the rest of the Bible and even into the New Testament, you don't see anything about tattoos. And it gives me a chance to make sure we're all clear on how we should read the Bible. As we get into the Old Testament, it's the Word of God. Amen? It is the Hebrew Bible. It is the word of God. When you get into the New Testament, though, the new covenant in Jesus Christ, the most faithful way to read the scripture is always hold up the Old Testament as the word of God as well. But we always read it through the lens of the New Testament. And I believe as I think about this question, I believe it comes down to, how shall I put it? whether or not we want to leave a legacy of light or darkness when it comes to tattoos. Follow me here for a moment. Cutting and even some, even some methods of tattooing are associated with punishment, and in many cases, they are associated with darkness. You see this on people's body. So if you're thinking about getting a tattoo and you realize the new covenant does not warn against it, you want to ask yourself this question, am I putting something on my body that represents darkness or light? Is the image or the message about this tattoo one of light or darkness? Does it serve as a reminder of past guilt or inflicting emotional distress? Or does it bring about goodness, redemption, Light, maybe even Christ himself. So at the end of the day, if you are a Christian, I believe that changes everything. This is really, really important. If you want a tattoo, you need to be very careful. You need to think long and hard. It is permanent unless you pay to get it removed later. And I've seen some removals that don't look that good. Consider its permanency and be very careful. I know a guy who uh, fell in love with a young lady 
asked her to marry him. She said yes, and he got her tattooed. I think her name was Rachel. He got it tattooed right across his heart. Right before the wedding, she dropped him like a ton of bricks. You need to be very, very careful with a tattoo. But is it wrong? I sure hope not because I'm thinking really hard about getting one, FYI. But I'm being careful. And I can promise you if I do, it will be something that is connected to God and uh, what Christ has done in my life. All right, rapid fire questions. You guys have been eating these up. Christina, our um, director of first contact here at the Durham campus has been engaging me. So here we go, Christina. All right, last round. You ready, Pastor? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, first one. What's the funniest moment you've had in ministry? We were at the high school in the early days, 2002, and I was doing a series on the great physician and um, that the church is an emergency room or a hospital for sinners. And we had all the people on the stage in, um, in uh, medical attire. They were dressed like doctors and nurses and uh, scrubs. And one of the guys who was playing the guitar got called up in the spirit. And he started jumping up and down and, and going bonkers with the music. And the, the scrubs didn't fit him very well. And so his pants fell down to his ankles. And he didn't know, <laughs> he didn't know anything to do. So he just ran off the stage. And uh, I had to walk up on the stage in that moment, trying not to laugh and explaining that sometimes uh, the people get caught up in the spirit and you never know what, what will happen in church. And it was just a funny moment. Sounds like an interesting follow-up. It, it was crazy. <laughs> All righty. So what is something you've prayed for, waited on for years, and then saw God's provision and faithfulness? This land mm. in the Durham campus, in the epicenter of North Carolina. Yeah. God provided it through an encounter at a state fair after I'd been looking for it for years. Very nice. And what's one vice you wish you could give up? Ah, oh, probably like most of us, man, eating too much, knowing when to stop. <laughs> Portion, portions of food is, is one that, we, uh, that I could get better at. Personally, for me, cookout is a challenge. <laughs> Come on, man. And when I go, Christina, you don't make me talk about these longer than I want to. When I go to cookout, you can't go to cookout and not get a shake. You know what I'm saying? And a, tra a tray. It's $5. I mean, they only have like, you know, 80 shakes that are available <laughs> on the menu. For sure, for sure. All righty. So sweet or savory? Sweet. Sweet. And what's one thing most people don't know about you? That... Uh, I'm a romantic. Um, mm -hmm. I think people see me as hard charging, task A leader, um, but uh, underneath that is a is a tender heart that is a, a hopeless romantic. Oh, I believe that. I believe that. And window or aisle seat on a plane? Oh, very easy. Um, short flights window, long flights aisle. And what is your favorite vacation spot? Mountains in the fall. Blue Ridge Parkway, mountains, boom, blowing rock area in the fall when the leaves are at peak leaf season. I am from the mountains. I can appreciate that. Come on now. <laughs> it's awesome. And what's something you always travel with? Um, headphones. Headphones. You got the noise canceling Sound time? canceling headphones. That's right. And I'm upset if I, if I show up and I forget them, it's not a good flight. Oh, <laughs> especially with a crying baby, right? <laughs> we love That's babies. Right. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> All right. And what's your morning routine? Morning routine? Get up, hit the shower, brush my teeth after the shower, straight to the coffee maker. Glory to God. <laughs> straight to the coffee after that. <laughs> All right, and what did you eat for breakfast today? <laughs> Nothing. I don't eat breakfast. Don't eat breakfast. Just, just do coffee. coffee. And I know you health, health experts are going to tell me breakfast is the most important meal. I'm just not hungry, so I just do coffee. All right, fair enough. And I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but what's the cutest thing ever? <laughs> oh, uh, a litter of puppies <laughs> <laughs> or a little baby. Maybe I should, a little baby or a little puppy. I knew it was going to be puppies or something like that. Abby, <laughs> the way that you fawn over her. <laughs> All righty. And what's your most desired quality in a friend? Um, loyalty. A loyal friend is mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And what do you do to decompress? I, uh, I like to run, so jog, 
and um, ride my motorcycle. Yeah, I'm going to let you have the running. I am not a runner. Go I for was, it. All the great. road is yours. It takes the edge off. It's awesome. Nice. And would you ever go bungee jumping? Heck to the no. <laughs> no. Like I would never jump out of a plane and skydive. Why do you wear a helmet? If the parachute doesn't open, you're toast. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with any of that stuff. <laughs> okay. And what do you think is a common misconception about pastors? Oh, yeah, uh, that, that we only work on Sunday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's a good one. Oh, my Lord. All righty, last and most certainly not least, what is your favorite book of the Bible and why? Philippians, and because the theme of Philippians is joy mm -hmm. and the power of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I just love that power-packed book, which, by the way, in a few weeks, I'm starting a sermon series on joy, and I can't wait to deliver it. Sounds good. Well, that's what I have for you, Pastor. Thanks hey, for entertaining Hey, good job, Christina. Questions. Would everybody just type in, because she's done this for three weeks in a row. <laughs> type in and give Christina some love and thank her for leading the rapid fire questions. Love you guys. All right, here we go. Question number four. Got to move quickly. Suicide seems to be gaining popularity. Do you automatically go straight to hell if you kill yourself? Now, I grew up in the South, um, and kind of the buckle of the Bible belt, if you will. And one of the myths that I heard over and over growing up, even though we were unchurched, we never went to church, I heard this all the time, that suicide is the only unpardonable or unforgivable sin. And you might have heard that. That's not in Scripture. That is a myth. The Bible says that the only unpardonable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Let's read it out loud together. Matthew 12, 31, Jesus himself said, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. As I said a few weeks ago, I'll just quickly repeat it. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit means denying the power or the conviction of the third person of the Trinity, i.e. the Holy Spirit. It's an act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for the Holy Spirit of God. But nowhere in Scripture, and this is what I always have done and will always do, I will keep driving us back to this book, hoping and praying that we can become better readers of the Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that suicide is unpardonable or unforgivable. And besides that, can I ask you this question? What kind of person who would declare on this side of eternity about a person who was in so much pain and so much depression and so much darkness that she or he took their lives. Who would stand on this side of eternity and declare that when it's not found in the word? Church, we've got to learn to be more gentle. That's so why we're doing the 30 days of kindness. We've got to learn to be more kind and sensitive. Philippians 4, 5 says this, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. So it's a real touchy subject for me. I had a really good friend, a pastor, who I helped start a church in Chapel Hill called Christ United Methodist Church in Southern Village while I was at Duke. I helped Reagan May start that church. And he took his life in his office at that church. And it wrecked me. And we found out later that he had been struggling with depression. I'm talking deep, dark depression for like 14 years. Nobody knew. In the last couple of years, I've known several pastors who've taken their lives, and I've known other people who have done it as well. And I realize that it's trending. And it just gives me a chance to say two things. One, no, we should never say that that person goes straight to hell. 
the Bible doesn't say that. We shouldn't say that. But secondly, if you're out there and the storm clouds have been brewing and you find yourself in that dark place, and you find yourself thinking things that you shouldn't think, and you find yourself contemplating suicide. Look at me, please. Hear me. Don't do it. We'll get through it. Think theological about it. God created you. We already said that every person is an image bearer. He breathed into you today the breath of life. And if he breathed into you today the breath of life, and if he wakes you up tomorrow and does the same, that tells me and it should tell you, God has a purpose for your life. He loves you. Seek help. There's no shame in this game. Everybody needs help from time to time. Find you a good therapist. Seek help. On rare occasion, if you need medication, take medication. Get good advice. Do your research. Share with those you can trust. Share with those loyal friends like I talked about earlier. Find you a good Bible-believing, Jesus-exalting church. Find community. But whatever you do, don't check out. We need you here. This world needs you here. God has chosen to let you stay here. Please, I beg you, don't do it. You'll get through it. We love you. We're praying for you. And if you're anywhere near New Hope, come be a part of us. Come. And if you're not near us, get in a virtual life group. Do life with others. Don't do it. Question number five, let's go. Does the Bible mention if humans are superior over animals? Does the Bible mention if animals were put here for human consumption? Yes. Yes to both. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, all the way back to the first book of the Bible. Check it out. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, that's an important word, dominion, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God gave man and woman, dominion to rule over the earth after the likeness and the image of himself, God. Second part of the question, does the Bible mention that animals were put here for our consumption? Again, the answer is yes. Look at Leviticus 11.2. Say to the Israelites, of all the animals on the land... These are the ones you may eat. And then if you go read the rest of Leviticus 11, you will see excruciating detail about the animals that they could eat and the animals that they could not eat. But check it out, just so you know. Those of us living in North Carolina, this is an important one. Pork was on the do not eat list. Now, listen closely. In the same way that I talked about tattoos, this is why we are to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. And in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, the Bible says this, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Verse 11. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. Check this out. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice from heaven told Peter, told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. So yes, it is clear in Scripture that we can eat animals. Check it out. 
it's also clear that if you don't want to eat animals or meat, that's perfectly acceptable as well. So this is real important. Whatever you do, make sure you do it to the glory and honor of God. And as I have often said, if you don't want to eat meat, that is perfectly fine. I thank God for you. It leaves more meat for people like me. Glory to God. Question number six, let's wrap up. How can I have a relationship with God? That's a great Great question, and I'm glad you asked it at the end of this series. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Verse 17, therefore, and some of you know this verse, and if not, you should put this verse to memory. If anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here, praise God. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, check it out, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So check it out. Very, very, very important. Let me make this simple. The way in which you become a Christian is you ask Christ into your life. And when Christ comes into your life, the Bible says you've been born again. And when you're born again, just like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and a new creation or a new creature comes to life. The old self is gone and the new life begins. And it doesn't just end there. Paul then says, after you're saved, you become a part of a family whose mission is to be ministers of reconciliation. Ambassadors that bring people together, regardless of socioeconomic levels, regardless of skin color, regardless of this or regardless of that. We are ambassadors for Christ. And life then becomes sacred. It becomes holy. God starts to do a work in your life where you find your ultimate purpose and passion in and through Jesus. And I want to show you a video about a one such Stephen Scully at our Sanford campus that has experienced a front row seat at watching God bring about salvation. When this video is over, I'm going to come back. We got no more music, so, so stay with us. I'm just going to come back right after this video, and I'm going to wrap us up today. But we thought you should see the power of a salvation story as we wrap this series up. Check it out. So I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey. My mom and dad were both Catholic. So as soon as I was born, I was stamped Catholic. So I went to Catholic school, went to Catholic church, was brought up in that environment. You know, I had all the head knowledge, but I didn't have any inkling as far as a, a faith in my life growing up. It was more of the party life for me. I went into the Marine Corps two days after I graduated high school, was promoted quick, did my job well. I was an observer in an artillery unit. That was a big part of my life, and I thought that was something I would always do, and I was never going to get out of the service. But um, God was nowhere in my life, um, wasn't even on the scene. I was in a helicopter accident in 89. That pretty much changed all that. My, my upbringing, my example of just work real hard, when I got down here, that's what I did, I, I worked. Um, didn't realize that I was ignoring my wife. A few guys, they showed up and they asked me if I wanted to make some extra money. 
And since money was my God, I said, of course. But little did I know these guys were, uh, they were Christians. A few months after I met them, they brought me to a, a function in uh, Virginia and a man started sharing the gospel. And when he was preaching, everything he was talking about, I listened and, and I knew it was true. And, and I believed everything he said. And all of a sudden he got to a point, he said, if, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that was me. And I prayed, I sat there in my chair and, and I just prayed and I poured my heart out to God. I remember coming home, going in, seeing my wife. And uh, at the time we didn't have a good relationship and uh, she knew something was different. Lord completely changed my direction. We started going to different churches and we went to New Hope a couple times. I remember today we were driving back in from Cary and we just looked at each other and we knew that we we're gonna go to church at New Hope. We started a life group and we've been there for a little over a year now. And uh, you know, things are going great. I talked to Josh and, and I asked him if we can go out and do some visitations, things like that. So we uh, planned a day, we went over to the local hospital here in Sanford. Josh and I were um, just walking down the hallway and we, we saw an elderly woman sitting in a room. So we just knocked and asked her if she wanted to visit. She welcomed us in and she was with her daughter. Her name was Miss Nance and it just happened to be that I knew her son and uh, she immediately opened up to us. Before we left, I just asked Miss Nance one question. If you were to die tonight, just suddenly here, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And she looked at us and said, no. So Josh and I just opened up the Bible and we shared from the Bible how, how she could know for sure she'd go to heaven if she died. And, and so we, we talked a good while with her. By the time we got through with it, we just prayed with both of them and they, and they both prayed uh, for that assurance of their salvation. About two months after uh, I'd gotten a phone call from her son and he asked me if I was in the hospital doing visitations and met his mom and I said, sure. He shared with me that when we left that night, she called him and she said, David, I just want you to know that when I die, I'm gonna to go to heaven. And the next day they discharged her from the hospital. She went back to her home in Lillington and when she got home, she had a heart attack. Uh, David had gotten a message to try to get there and when he got there, he found out that his mom had already passed on. Obviously he was very sad, but he remembered that phone call and it was, you know, that, that was almost her gift to him, you know, to just let him know, hey, everything's gonna be okay. And you just never know who you're gonna touch and when you're gonna touch them at the right time. A lot of people feel as if they aren't qualified, but all of us are qualified because we're all called to go. And that was a command. What an absolute amazing story. You see, when, when God comes into a person, he then takes that person and he starts to use that person for his glory in the world. And just like Stephen and Josh went into this hospital and prayed over this woman, and little did they know that the very next day she would pass from this world and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But because they had been faithful and obedient, because they had allowed God to use them as ambassadors of reconciliation, the Bible declares that that woman passed from this world, not into judgment, not into hell, but into a place called heaven forever. And maybe that's at the heart of your question. How can I be saved? You simply open up your heart you open up your life to Christ, and he starts to give you. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life abundantly. It's not just some pie in the sky when I die. The abundant life can start here and now and can carry you to the day you meet your maker and you pass from this world into heaven forever. One final story and a scripture and a prayer, and we're done. A father and a son were riding down the road on a beautiful summer's day, down a country road, and suddenly out of nowhere, a bumblebee flew into the car window. And since his son was deathly allergic to bee stings, and the son immediately became petrified, his father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee, squeezed it in his hand, and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, the young son became frantic once again as it buzzed by the little boy. And the father sensed his son's terror 
And once again, he reached out his hand. But this time he pointed to his hand. And there stuck in his skin was the stinger of the bee. And he said to his boy, he said, you see this? You don't have to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. Beloved, that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for you. When he came from heaven, he lived 33 years and showed us the ways of God. And then, if that weren't enough, he spread wide his arms. And he said, I love you this much. And he died on a cross for you where his blood, the scriptures teach, forgives us of our sin. His blood, his life, his death, his resurrection redeems us, saves us here and now, brings about the new life and secures eternity with God forever. And that is precisely why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, read this out loud with me, wherever you are, where, O oh death, is your victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death, listen in, is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So how can you be saved? You put your faith, you put your hope, you put your trust in Jesus Christ who will take away the sting of death and secure and promise us victory with him forever. And the way you do that is you simply pray and you receive him as Lord and as Savior. Lord means that he is the master of my life. From this day forward, I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to follow his word and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He is Lord. Savior means I'm going to put my trust and faith and hope in the fact that he died on a cross for me. And through that act by the Son of God, the one and only Son of God, I can be saved, redeemed, and born again. So if you're out there and you desire that, or maybe you desire just to simply rededicate your life to that, I want you to pray with me right now, will you? Lord Jesus, thank you for those who've submitted these questions. Thank you for this series. And thank you for the man, the woman, the student, the child who is out there right now. And God, they're desiring salvation. They're desiring to have you remove the sting of death and give them victory in Christ. And if that's you, just pray a simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. Lord Jesus, I receive you as Lord, master of my life, and as Savior, the one who died and shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. Come into me today. Make me that new creation that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 talks about. Oh God, may the old be gone and may the new come to life in me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for adopting me as a child of the most high God. I am yours, you are mine. Lead me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, listen to me. Welcome to the family of God. The Bible says you have been adopted into the family. Now, here's what I want you to do, please. If you would be so kind, take out your phone and simply text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 59769. We want to help you grow in your faith. We want to get connected with you. If you've never been to a New Hope campus, listen, when we open up later this summer, come on by a campus. We will make you feel right at home. 
Hey, I hope you have a great week. By the way, I'm sending out now a devotion each and every Wednesday on the book of James. If you did not get that this past Wednesday, just go to our website, newhopechurch.org. Go to the little connect with us button in the middle. Click on that, fill that out. We will add you to our email list and you will get a devotion straight from me dropped into your inbox every Wednesday. Lastly, hey, you don't want to miss next weekend. I know it's 4th of July weekend and you might be scattered out doing a bunch of stuff. Be sure to dial in. We're going to be looking at the names of God next Sunday. Same time, same place. Have a great week and God bless you.